We're diving into the NHL playoffs with ESPN's Emily Kaplan. Plus, Utah is the hot new sports destination. We could see record rookie contracts for this NFL draft class. And the NFL is looking down under for its latest international move. It's Friday, April 26th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Last night's draftees are set to sign life-changing contracts. Last year, the top 10 picks in the NFL draft each signed deals worth at least $5 million annually, led by top pick Bryce Young, who signed a four-year $37.9 million deal with the Panthers. The back of the first round still brought in around $3 million per season. But this year, those numbers could get a lift because the NFL salary cap grew by $30 million. Caleb Williams is likely to push for an eight-figure deal. That might not even be unfamiliar territory for him. Reports came out in February that he made around $10 million in NIL deals over the last two years at USC. There's plenty more where that came from if he can make good on his massive potential in the NFL. Earlier this week, we had Commander's running back Austin Eckler on the show, and I asked him which country he would most like to play an NFL game in. He chose Australia, and it's possible that at some point he'll get his wish. The NFL made its latest move to expand internationally by opening a training Southern part of Australia's Gold Coast region, centered at A.B. Patterson College. Starting in September, 12 to 18-year-olds will be able to apply to an educational and football training program. The league has a similar program in the U.K., which has become a pipeline for college football scholarships in the U.S. 19 alumni of the U.K. program will play in Division I programs in the 2024 college season. The program in Australia will also look to grow flag football, in case you needed any more indication about how serious the NFL is about promoting flag. While the NFL hasn't committed to playing regular season games down under, it's a good guess that they'll get there eventually. Right now, the Rams and Eagles hold marketing rights in the country, which from Philadelphia is a mere 20-hour flight away. It wasn't so long ago that we were talking about Las Vegas as the hot sports city, but that designation has traveled north on Highway 15 to Salt Lake City. Their NWSL team just came back, they have an NHL team coming next season, and they are virtually assured of landing the 2034 Winter Olympics, What's more, the Winter Games might become a semi-regular event in Utah. With climate change making wintry environments more of a rarity over time and cities around the globe losing their enthusiasm for building a lot of infrastructure that they'll only need for three weeks, the International Olympic Committee is considering moving the Winter Olympics away from the competitive bidding process and toward a fixed schedule where a few cities would rotate hosting duties. IOC President Thomas Bach has said that by 2040, there might only be 10 countries with the appropriate climate for hosting the Winter Games, which is not the kind of thing you say if you want to keep cities bidding against each other. Salt Lake City has already shown that it can make use of their Olympic venues once the games have left town. Since hosting in 2002, they have used the same facilities to host high-level speed skating, skiing, snowboarding, bobsled, luge, skeleton, and biathlon events. With a three-city rotation, the Winter Olympics could still feel global, while making it a lot easier for the hosts to make their investment worthwhile. Joined once again now by ESPN hockey reporter Emily Kaplan. Welcome, Emily. So great to be with you, Owen. I always love talking shop with you. Yeah, great to have you back on. So where we are into the NHL playoffs, my sense heading in is that there are a lot of obviously really strong teams. No one's super dominant, though. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I felt like the last couple of weeks of the season, I kept asking players and coaches around the league, um, just kind of, you know, their sense of who were favorites and which were the teams to beat. And it felt like this year, more than any other year, it felt like the field was wide open. Um, people were picking so many different teams. It's funny. I think the one team that came up the most over the last two weeks of the season was the Dallas Stars. Everyone was like, this is the most complete team. Jake Odger found his game. Look at their defensive core. Look at their veterans and mix of rookies. And they're down 0-2 against the defending Stanley Cup champions, Vegas Golden Knights, in their first round series. They were the second wild card team to make it in. Um, in the East, there are teams that do look like they've overmatched their first round opponent, like the Rangers over the Washington Capitals, the last team to make it in. The Canes look fantastic against the Islanders. Um, but there's probably five or six teams that I could legitimately tell you right now that could win the Stanley Cup. And that is super exciting for us hockey fans and super stressful for those that are going to the rink every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I caught a little of the Rangers game, and it just doesn't feel like they're going to lose that series. But you know, it's 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 the playoffs. A lot of things can happen. Um, is this level of parity? Is it? Would you say this is by design, or is it just it's just how things usually go in the NHL? This is Gary Bettman's league. He is the longtime commissioner, the longest serving commissioner in North American sports. 
and he's obsessed with parody. Like this is what he wants more than anything else. So because of that, I would say it's by design that the salary cap has made it as such that every team um, does have a legitimate chance as long as they're committed to winning. Now, some teams are not committed to winning. They're committed to rebuilding, like the Blackhawks, the Sparks are a good example of that. They went into the year uh, designed not to win uh, so that they could tank for Macklin Celebrini, our new number one pick that we're about to find out in a couple weeks uh, where he'll end up. But this is exactly what Gary wants, and it's exactly what we're getting. And it does make for the most exciting postseason in all of sports. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and like the NBA has a similar uh, salary structure, you know, with the cap and, you know, obviously you can only fit so much under there. But with the NBA, you need like 12 guys and you really need like six or seven or eight guys. The NHL, you need like a 16, 16 deep to like, you know, be competitive. Um, this year feels like we've got some major markets that could make a run. You mentioned the Rangers look really strong. Uh, one of the Bruins and Maple Leafs is will at least get to the second round. Um, if you truth serum the NHL, do you think there are certain teams that they'd like to see make a deep run? Certain teams make the league money. Um, it's point blank. You know, every time you look at the franchise rankings for valuations, the Toronto Maple Leafs are always on top right there with the New York Rangers here in America. The Boston Bruins do quite well for us. So um, it's good for the league's health when those teams do well, just because um, we're still a very gate driven revenue league. Um, you know, they bring in a lot of bucks with the sales that they have for those arenas, but also just the TV ratings. That said, I know Gary Bettman, if you gave him the truth serum, would be like, I would be really happy with a Winnipeg Jets Carolina hurricane series because those are two markets we feel really strongly about. Um, and for the Winnipeg Jets, it's actually interesting because they were having a ton of attendance issues early on in the year. Their owner basically came out and was giving a wake up call to fans like, hey, you guys got to show up or we might lose this team. We're a small market. Um, and Gary Bettman does care about the small market markets as well because they're vital to the league. Yeah, I am kind of low key rooting for Winnipeg just because because yeah, they they could use a good story. Uh, and you mentioned the the gate. This was a record attendance year for the the regular season. What do you think went into making that happen? I think it's just overall growth of the league. I mean, we're starting to see the TV ratings come out for the playoffs and they're also up. I think People are catching on to hockey. Um, I don't want to be completely navel grazing right now and uh, you know toot our own horn, but the fact that we're now in year three of the ESPN and Turner deal um, and we're seeing the hockey world matriculate across the ESPN ecosystem. We're starting to talk about it on first take. P.K. Subban and many other hockey guests are on Pat McAfee's show. Um, you see it on PTI now. Like I just think there's general more awareness here in the U.S. Um, and the game has just never been better. As for the gate revenue specifically, um, it is what it is. This is a gate-driven league. Um, that is a huge portion of the revenue for the NHL. And I think that some of the markets that have seen huge spikes, the Carolina Hurricanes, I know, have seen a spike. They've been a very good team for a while. But the Florida Panthers were among the top three teams um, that increased their gate traffic um, the most this year. Well, look what they did last year, making it all the way to the Stanley Cup final. Phil Zito, their GM, has built a very entertaining team. The way they play is just awesome to watch um and they've galvanized that fan base which is really great to see and so yeah with with all the fans coming in uh that's just going to stoke the talk of expansion but expansion is kind of already happening all of a sudden because the coyotes are going to utah and and alex marulo gets to reactivate the franchise which is a term i'd never heard before um if he can make an arena happen in in the phoenix area uh, let's let's start with that situation. How do you like his odds of uh, of actually making that happen? This is challenging because I, I think we just have to kind of rewind a little bit. Arizona is Gary Bettman's baby. He does not want to leave that market. It is a bustling market. It's a fast growing market. There's so many people who live in the greater Phoenix area and they want to tap into it. Unfortunately, they picked an owner who just could not get an arena deal done. And they gave him all the patience in the world, really so much support, maybe too much support if you ask some other owners. And finally, Gary couldn't force him to sell the team, but he looked this man in the eyes and said, can you tell these players that it's okay for them to play in a less than 5,000 seat college arena for, for some of them their entire career? No, you can't. So he basically is saying, we have gotten all this interest in expansion from all these different teams um, and all these different markets. The owner that we feel best about is Ryan Smith. He owns the Utah Jazz. He's in his mid forties. He made his money in tech. He's really innovative and creative. We trust him. So we're going to go put this team there. We'll activate a new market. That's great. We were curious about Salt Lake City. Maybe it wasn't number one on their 
to-do list, but like, we just feel like the health of this team will be okay in that market in this man's hands. And to get that team away, to pry them away from Alex Morello, again, he couldn't force them to sell them. He had to broker this deal. And in a lot of ways, it was ingenious. As you mentioned, it was unprecedented. Talking to people around the league, they don't have a lot of faith in Alex Morello. They feel like he has really upset a lot of politicians, a lot of the movers and shakers in Arizona who might block him from being able to get it done. But in good faith, they got to let him do it. So he's going to try to win this land auction on June 27th. We'll see what happens there. There's certain benchmarks that he needs to hit. Um, I'd love to see him to be able to pull it through. I think that would be a great story. I'd love to see somebody be able to pull it through. And I do believe in my heart of hearts that the NHL will eventually return to Arizona. It's just whether it's in this five-year window with Alex Merlo, whether they can break some of those contracts and say like, okay, we can do it in three years with another owner because he didn't meet his benchmarks or if it's with someone else. Yeah. yeah I mean, a, a, a problematic owner is, I mean, I feel like every sport has at least one, at least most of the time. And it, there's just not a lot you can do. I mean, it's, you can't, unless it's a very severe, like Donald Sterling level situation, you, you can't, force these people to to sell their teams um but i guess you can i guess you can take them away and say you know you, you have to actually do the thing to, to get this team back um where else do you think uh the the nhl is looking to, to potentially expand yeah so they have heard from a variety of different markets we always hear about quebec city we know that canada would love another team i just think that the nhl feels that they've tapped out with a canadian audience like Everyone in Canada who would want to be a hockey fan is already a hockey fan. Here in the U.S., there's just so much more potential for growth. Houston, they've been really interested in that market, obviously, because of its size. Kansas City has intrigued them. Uh, Gary Bettman recently said that he's heard from Cincinnati as another potential market. Um, so there's a couple around here. I think number one on the NHL's list right now, though, is Arizona, which does feel ironic if you look at it from the outside of like, wait, you just left. But again, when you understand the intricacies of not having the most stable ownership, not just Alex Morello, but the couple owners prior to him as well, um, you understand why it's just a frustrating situation for the NHL. They want to be there. They just can't fight the right person to do it. Yeah. And is it just that, I mean, it's like a top 12 market or something by, by population and media. Is it just like, if you're a league of their size, it just... You, you can't not have a team there. It's one of the fastest growing um, metropolis areas in the country. There's a lot of snowbirds who go down there. We know that spring training's there. Um, so there's a lot of Canadians who go vacation down there. Uh, people from Chicago, that's where, you know, the Chicago Cubs go, New York. Um, they just feel like they could do a really good job the same way they did with the Florida team of just building some inherent hockey fans, um, but then some new fans as well. And then I also should note that the youth hockey has done a really good job um, just building slowly but stably. And now we have NHL stars. I mean, we're always going to cite Austin Matthews, but now we have Shane Doan's son who's in the NHL, Matthew Nyes, who's starring for the Maple Leafs as well. So we're starting to produce legitimate talent from there as well. And let's hop back to Utah for a second. It does feel like Ryan Smith is one of these owners that at least initially is going to try to make it fun for the fans. And, you know, like, I mean, he's doing this bracket for to choose the team name, which I think is kind of fun. And I am determined to galvanize my listeners to pick Yetis, assuming that is one of the the options. What are your expectations for, uh, for hockey in Utah? Yeah, I've had, been able to chat with Ryan Smith a couple times over the last few months, including right after he got the team. And that man has some energy. And I think... I've been to NHL Board of Governors meetings many times, um, and I want to say this with the utmost respect, but it's a very homogeneous group. It's, um, you know, the NHL likes family-owned teams, and that's why they did pick. It's not just Ryan. It's Ryan and Ashley Smith, his wife. She's very involved as well. Um, but it's a lot of old white men, and this is someone who's younger, who, again, made his money on his own, is still very involved in the tech space, has done some really innovative things with the Utah Jazz, which he also owns, you know, creating their own over-the-top streaming network so that fans can just come to them um, to watch jazz games and, and things like that. He's already done a really good job of just ingratiating himself with the local politics Politicians. A bill has passed in the Utah State Senate, started his approval from the governor to renovate the Delta Center, but also create an entertainment district just to revitalize downtown Salt Lake City. Um, and so I expect it to be a passionate, loud, exciting fan base. I expect a lot of the same things that we saw with the Seattle Kraken when they first came in. I would kind of liken them to them. They had a lot of Amazon support with some of their minority owners, including Andy Jassy. Um, as for the team name, I'm with you. I think the Yetis is super fun. But 
they might have a placeholder, you know, they're working with a branding agency, but also canvassing the community. And if they don't get it done in time, I mean, this guy had to pull it out of the hat in six weeks. They might have a temporary name. I think that temporary name is going to be Utah HC. And I really like that. I kind of think it's cool. Yeah, it's just a throwback to football clubs, um, just kind of classy. And it's celebrating Utah as a state and a market. So Yetis or Utah HC are cool with me. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, I just want to hop briefly over to the next CBA. I saw you commenting about how teams kind of play salary cap games around the playoffs to, you know, sneak in a player on their roster. Um, and you said yeah, that that could come up in the next CBA. What do you think are going to be the the big issues uh, when, you know, the next time they have to hash out a deal? Yeah, um, that will be one of them. You know, it's the Mark Stone situation. Vegas Golden Knights are going to be the face of this issue. But are we OK with the way the current rules are? where teams can kind of play some salary cap gymnastics and stow a player away during the regular season and then all of a sudden activate them on day one of the playoffs. The Vegas Golden Knights have done it. It's been to the law of the CBA, but a lot of teams feel like there's something fishy going on. So I'm curious if that's going to come up as an issue. I think player care is going to be a big issue. Um, remember the Jack Eichel situation where he had a serious neck injury. Um, he was in Buffalo at the time. The Buffalo surgeons and management um, had final say over what type of surgery the player got. And he said, that's messed up. I want to get this new surgery that no NHL player had, but I feel really strongly about it. He had to facilitate a trade to Vegas because that was the team that would do it. Um, but I think for the player side, just having the final say over their own medical rights will be an issue for them. Typically for players, they're also very concerned about the right to compete in international competition that was not written into the CBA and is one of the reasons the NHL could get away with missing out on the past several Olympics. The NHL basically did this handshake agreement and has guaranteed the players that they will create a Four Nations Cup that we're going to see next year. That's going to be the the All-Star Game and that they can go to Milan in 2026. So as long as that happens, I think the players are going to be cool. Um, and then escrow, you know, <laughs> it's always when it comes to the players, the big issue for them is how much money is actually coming to their pockets and the hockey rec uh, related revenue system where they split 50 50. But sometimes the players have to take out loans and they don't get all the money back that they want to get back. I can see that as being a big one that they fight for. Before we let you go, uh, who's winning the cup and who are they beating? So before the season, I picked the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, and then they asked us for a preseason prediction about two weeks ago before the playoffs began. And I panicked uh, and I just looked uh, at who was doing really well lately, which of the teams I covered that I just felt strongest about. And I picked the New York Rangers. So East Coast team, West Coast team, I think these are the two teams that will make the Stanley Cup final now, considering how Vegas has manhandled uh, Dallas in those first two games, even though I think that's going to be a long series. And I think I'm going to pick the Rangers. There's just something special brewing with them right now. Um, Igor Shosturkin looks amazing. They just Every position group is complete. They've got a lot of depth, and Peter Laviolette has proven to be the right coach for them. So you can sue me later when uh, this is absolutely incorrect and they get upset very soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that pick will be popular in the FOS offices. Emily Kaplan, thanks so much for joining us. I know. I'm saying this to a man who literally has a devil's hat over his shoulder. So apologies. <laughs> what happened this year? Ah, oh, it's so frustrating. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Owen. That's it for today. I've been pushing the name Utah Yetis, but if you have an idea for the name of the Utah hockey team, drop it in a review of this show on Apple Podcasts and maybe throw in some comments about the actual show so that people who don't have that context won't be very confused. We'll shout out the best suggestions. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.